your seat. Last people in, We're closing the door. Okay, welcome everybody. On behalf of Rethink Pakhuis de Zwijger and Are We Europe, welcome to this very first Are We Europe meetup. Tonight we'll celebrate the second print edition of this magazine. I'm just going to show it to you. I just got a chance to see it, to go through it, and it looks amazing. So I'm just going to already tell you, you can get one. It's 10 euros. You can buy it afterwards. So please do it. Beautiful. So tonight we're going to celebrate this new print magazine, and we'll be doing so by discussing some of the topics that is, are raised in the magazine more in depth. Um, I am Eve Blankford, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, um, working a lot on migration topics, and tonight I'll be your host. So what is the main theme of the night? It's finding home in the city. Finding a home for who? Refugees, labor migrants, migrants from former colonies, second generation migrants. Who do we consider to be residents of Amsterdam? Who do we consider to be Amsterdamers? What about those who have been here for decades, for generations? And what about those who just arrived, maybe just a week ago, maybe just a few months ago? Who are those people who are living in our cities and how do we make them feel more at home? So that's what we're gonna talk about. And how will we do that? Well, we'll talk to a lot of people. We're doing a lot of things. So it's gonna be a lot of conversation. I have to keep it short. You're all invited to ask questions, but keep it short. And just think about it as a way to get inspired. An evening that raises a lot of questions and you'll be able to talk more about it and read more about it later. So we'll be following two of the articles from the U We Are Here, uh, we Are We Europe magazine. Um, and we will talk to different ex experts and representative of city-based initiatives that attempt to create homes or fe feelings of belonging in the city and beyond. With our first panel, we will be talking about different labor migration communities in Amsterdam. And after that, we will go to the so-called open stage. And I just want to already zoom in a bit, because that's where you come in, the audience. You can have the stage. Why? Well, you can share your own experience of belonging in the city or maybe not belonging. You can sing or dance, but maybe just share an experience, a thought. Welcome, everybody. So think about something that if you, want, if you want to share something, you're more than invited to do so. After the open, open stage, we'll go to the next panel, and that is a panel called Are Muslims the New Jews? Well, we'll have uh, experts on that as well, so we'll find out. And we'll end the night with our final panel called Finding Home in the City in which we'll look more in depth at the changing demographics of our cities and how that yeah, basically changes the diversity of our cities. What does that mean? And also we'll raise the question of what, we, what can we do to become more welcoming ourselves? So a lot, I told you. But let's first start with asking the people behind Are We Europe magazine to the stage. So please give a warm round of applause for Kirill Hartog and Alexander Hurst. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thanks for having us, first of all. Pakas de Zwerge, thank you. A special thanks to Julia Muller, who made all of this possible. We're super, super excited to be here and to uh, announce our latest issue, which is really, really exciting. Uh, but most of all, to talk about this important subject, uh, of which, of course, we know much less about than our great, great, great panel of experts. Uh, but uh, it's, it's quite interesting because um, in the 90s, of course, we heard scholars telling us that globalization would take the world by storm and that societies would change and that identities would change with them as borders would become less and less important. Uh, and if we look at the world today, we might think that they were right. Uh, we have become increasingly interconnected. Uh, the internet has brought us closer. And these are questions that have fundamentally changed the way that we live and the way that we identify. Um, but of course, even in cities such as Amsterdam, where lots of people from all over Europe and beyond live together or side by side, um, we still see 
that the conversation about Europe is being held at a national level, in national media. And that's why we decided to create Are We Europe? Are We Europe is a platform for European creatives, young Europeans, photographers, video makers, journalists, writers. We're more than 500 today. We started a few years ago. Uh, who together can co-create to tell Europe's borderless story. That's what we do. And we think this is really important to add this narrative to the European discourse. Um, I'm going to grab my notes because, you know, you think you prepare and then you forget everything you say. Um, anyway, this magazine that we're publishing here, it's, uh, it's being released four times a year. And we choose a different theme every time that we hope reveals something new about what it means to be European. We do it in English, and we engage our entire network to do so. Uh, I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to give the floor to our editor, Alex Hurst, who can say much more about this theme. So what we wanted to do with Uprooted was really get to the heart of some of this, oops, sorry, of some of this fluidity that our societies are grappling with, and this paradox that we have more and more freedom to choose our identities and our lives, and at the same time, many people are struggling with a sense of loneliness and this need to have stability and security. And so we mainly have more questions than we do answers, right? So how many layers are there to our identities? How do those layers fit together? Does who we are depend on where we are or where we come from? Um, can our conceptions of ourselves and our places in the world really shift as quickly as we can actually shift our physical location in the world? And so we titled this magazine Uprooted, but maybe that wasn't even fair of us to do because we're presupposing that roots have something to do with identity, and maybe that's not at all true. So we have multiple articles and photo series in this magazine that try and get at this question of identity and movement from different angles. We have an article about why people are moving away from Bosnia. We have another article about how migrant women are impacting feminism in Europe. We have another piece that we'll talk about tonight, um, looking at the lives of Bangladeshi dishwashers in Parisian kitchens. And so we're really interested in hearing all of your feedback and your thoughts and your questions and maybe some of your answers to all of these things that we want to talk about tonight. So thank you so much for coming. All right, let's uh, move on to uh, the first panel, the labor migration in Amsterdam. Can I invite you to come to the table and I'm looking for our third guest Natalia are you here oh that's you yay <laughs> please join us I'll introduce you so I'll just introduce you um, I'll introduce you after we first listen to an expert, expert of um, the article from the Are We Europe magazine. And we're going to listen to a short piece <coughs> from the article Bangladeshi Cooks in Paris by Tommaso Melilli. So first listen and then we talk. Dishwasher Confidential. My name is Tommaso Melilli. I was born in Italy and I spent 10 years in Paris as a restaurant chef. Sometimes I write about food and its people. I, Tommaso, belong to the first generation of cooks who actually chose this job. I could have been scholar, engineer, lobbyist or journalist, but I am a cook. I love it and I'm pretty sure I hate being one of the other things above. I chose my own education step by step and I wanted it to be liberal. Feminist, European, post-colonial, and pinned with lots of critical thinking. Perhaps it's ironic then that after all of that, I find myself in the role of master, telling a story about those who serve. After 10 years of working as a chef, I still don't know how to turn on the dishwashing machine. Roshan is the most recent dishwasher I've worked with and the only one who wasn't from Bangladesh but rather from Sri Lanka. He's lived in France for 12 years, is a political refugee and a fervent Catholic. I can't even count the number of times my colleagues and I 
have tried to coax his story out of him. We understood crumbs of it. We understand that he had to leave during the civil war between the Tamil Tigers and the government, that he has a wife and four children st still in Sri Lanka, that he hadn't seen them in 12 years. We also learned, not long ago, that the oldest of the children still in Sri Lanka is 18, deaf and mute, which makes communicating over Skype fairly difficult, because Roshan only knows the rudimentary basics of sign language. We've managed to understand that he had problems getting legal papers, but we never quite understood what the problems were in detail. We knew that even during his vacation period, he refused to leave Paris because he was afraid of being detained. Since we have known him, Roshan has told us over and over that his legal situation was close to being resolved. Time and time again, he would take his little box of documents and go to see his lawyer. And every time he would, he would come back a little more defeated, asking for some documents and more signatures from the bus. With regular documents, the dishwashers are entitled to the same social protections as other workers in France. Five weeks minimum vacation, regulated types of contracts, contributions to work retirement and so on. But since many barely speak and read French properly, they often find their rights ignored. They trust friends and cousins who allegedly know a bit more, but in fact they live in a cloudy world of suspicion, rumour and fear. And over the years they develop their own magical thinking about bureaucracy. Roshan's greatest desire was to live for two months to see his family again. His smallest desire would be to go to Lourdes to see the shrine of Our Lady, the Virgin Mary. He loves horse races and from time to time he bets a bit of money on them. He's 46 years old. Before in Sri Lanka he was a photographer. Last month when I want to say goodbye to my former colleagues, including Roshan, he pulled out his wallet and showed me his driver's license, a sign that he had his papers in order now. This year, he finally got to spend Christmas with his family. If you want to read the whole article, buy the magazine. But I'm just going to make a lot of... Uh, commercials about the magazine tonight. Well, let's talk about uh, different labor mig migra migrant communities in Amsterdam. And this, of course, was in Paris, but let's take it to our city. Because there's a lot of people from all over the world who work and live here in Amsterdam, in our city, but that maybe don't necessarily take part in society, or maybe we just don't see them as Dutch, white Amsterdamers. Take, for example, domestic workers I might assume that many of them are just focusing on making money, sending it home, and not necessarily wanting to build a life here. But is that assumption true? And what about expats? How do they want to belong? Do they? Just a bit? I don't know. So let's talk about that with, um, well, the experts. Kate Kirk, a researcher and lecturer at Leiden University, and Ellen Ball, your professor at the FU, the Free University here in Amsterdam. And together you did a lot of research on these different labor migration communities. And we have Natalia Robledo Contreras, and you're a representative of the FMV, uh, the Network Group for Migrant Domestic Workers. Yes. Yep. All right. I'll ask you all to really take the mic, talk into it properly. Okay. So, um, Ellen, Kate, question for you too. You did uh, research on these different labor migra migrant groups. Can you just sort of paint a picture, a broad picture of what different groups are we talking about? Wow, oh, it's, a, it's a difficult question yeah. for me because uh, I didn't study different groups of migrants, but in the Amsterdam context, I focused on two. Uh, the first was the group of Hindustani Surinamese, who arrived mostly in the 70s and after that. 
Uh, and uh, recently, Kate and I were involved in a project on high-skilled migrants, or knowledge migrants, as we call them in the Netherlands. And in both projects, we were very interested in notions of belonging. And uh, uh, yeah, only based, so I can talk mostly uh, on the basis of that. I've also been involved in research on Bangladeshis. So in that mm -hmm. sense, I can recognize a lot from this uh, ra uh, this uh, reading. What do you recognize? Do yeah, you with that? Um, well, first of all, the, the precarity of these kind of migrants who are without papers. And I think that makes the group very different from the ones that we studied. So it shows one aspect of identity and belonging, uh, your paper, your situation, which uh, it's uh, for a large part determines uh, not, not just um, whether you can stay or whether you can have a work, but also how you relate to your environment. But I also like the fragment because it referred to another aspect of belonging, religion. Uh, he longed to go to Lourdes <coughs> as a pilgrim. And I think what we have been talking about a lot is uh, what's very important for migrants, and I think that matters for any kind of migrant, is their age and family situation. Mm -hmm. So we found in our study, for example, that uh, many of the high-skilled migrants from India who arrive uh, at the time of arrival, they are unmarried. And they have maybe worked for a couple of years in, a, in an enterprise in India. Uh, and uh, they're on an adventure. Mm. So they like it and they're not ne ne uh, necessarily looking for belonging. But at one point, their home front and also they themselves in their lives develop new expectations and they want to start a family. And that makes a huge difference. Mm. So they start to connect differently also to their own parents. Uh, they have to think of how to get a wife. Very often that's a wife from India. When, and w especially when they get children, uh, then they have to make new decisions. Where do I want to, where do I belong? And especially in the Dutch case, and then Kate, uh, Kate can continue, uh, what we realized was the uh, significance or the importance of the language of Dutch. When an Indian family settles here, and it may be for a few years in their minds, at the point that the children are going to school, they have to make a decision about their future. Is th are they going to stay? The kid will go to the Dutch school. If they want to move on or keep the options open, the kid goes to an international school. And very often we find that the parents, they cannot really make up their minds, but this choice mm. is uh, very significant. And also for in, in what me uh, sense they partake in society themselves. Very much, because yeah. if they're not, uh, if the children don't go to a Dutch school, the, the, cer the, the whole environment in which they find themselves <coughs> also, well, all parents, I don't know, I saw the audience very young, but maybe uh, the parents know that they get a lot of new connections through the schools of the children. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you look <coughs> at comparative countries like Switzerland, they encourage all their, mig all their labor migrants, who are primarily highly skilled, um, to send their children to Swiss schools mm. so that they integrate where in Holland we see high-skilled migrants um, and many other forms of labor migration uh, as temporary. So in that, the state, in some way, through their framing of these migrants as temporary, uh, creates uh, institutions like international schools or facilitates them in some way, um, which, which uh, disconnect some migrants from what we call mainstream Dutch society, if that exists. So that's another question in and of itself. But these kind of bubbles mm -hmm. of belonging um, are also not, not created by migrants themselves, but also by the state and the interaction with the state. And I think that's an important point to make when we talk about belonging and homemaking. Should that, uh, I mean, like, should that change? Like, is that, it, would it be better if it would be more inclusive? <laughs> yeah, what is yeah. better? It yeah. depends on... I, last week I had a meeting um, with, with some uh, policymaker who works on uh, uh, high-skilled migration policy at the national level. Uh, and he asked me, Don't, we, we think uh, <coughs> labor migration is good for Holland, right? It's good for Holland. I mean, what is good? Mm -hmm. What is good? Is it, I mean, it's, it's the same question that we have with um, big corporations. Is that a good thing? 
Um, should we give uh, tax breaks to uh, large inter- multinationals? Is that good for Holland or is it not good for Holland? There's on different side of the political spectrum, you get a different answer. And the same is for this. By facilitating um, la- high skilled ma- labor-, labor migration through international schools, for instance, the Dutch state makes themselves um, more uh, open or um, more accessible to this you know, big, the brain, uh, the, the competition for brains. So it puts themselves, puts it at a higher level. So, but is that, is that good for Dutch society? I don't know. It depends on how you define good and what is good. Is, is economic growth good? And I guess you could say yes, but is that economic growth unequal in some ways, or does it flow through to all acid, all levels of Dutch society? And yeah. to come back to that, that feeling of belonging, so you were talking about the Indian uh, community, um, high, sc- high educated, uh, skilled labor, uh, mi- migrants. Uh, what about other groups that you uh, you look, looked into? What sense of feeling of belonging do you do you see there? Well, first of all, it's, I think it's really uh, important to realize, and uh, our previous speakers also mentioned it, uh, we are now part of a globalized world. It doesn't mean that all of us are equally free to move. We see the peoples with people without work permits. They, of course, are not so free to move. But we are all connected in some way or the other to the place where we came from. So all of us uh, are transnational. Uh, migrants are also transnational. So when we talk about belonging and home, for nearly everyone, it has so many aspects, mm. right? So they might want, they, they may feel, uh, uh, for example, you talked about invisible groups. Um, we know that there are a lot of domestic workers living in Amsterdam Southeast. Now, they might be invisible to us who live here in the center of the city, but they are uh, very visible in, in ways, in se- several ways, if you walk around in the streets of uh, Amsterdam Southeast, for example. Um, where was it going? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> What was the question? The question was about uh, to give an idea of the different feelings. Yeah, of so of uh, groups. belonging yeah. it has I- you can belong to your neighborhood, but maybe not to the wider society. You and uh, what I uh, like very much is uh, what we get from the students. Uh, we have a lot of students from uh, whose parents were migrants from Turkey or uh, Morocco, and they say sometimes they say, "Well, I I'm, I, I feel." Maybe not so Dutch because of the whole uh, public debate, but I, f- I feel very Amsterdam. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so that dimension is also there. And yeah. as we said, that this transnational aspect is it allows you to connect to your, let's say, your parents, uh, but uh, it also forces you in a way to maintain connections. And not all migrants are so eager to do that. Because those kind of connections, especially for labor migrants, uh, they very often have o- also an economic dimension. They're expected to send remittances, mm-hmm. right? And uh, for a lot of migrants, and I know it about Bangladeshis, they get hugely indebted to to leave the country. The migration industry in Bangladesh is the most e- ex- expensive one in the world. So when people leave, They go through official channels. They have to take huge loans. Very often they sell their lands. And uh, they know they are indebted. So their relation also to their homelands, to their parents, or is also not so straightforward yeah. or easy. So belonging is n- really never simple. Yeah. yeah. Belonging is really never simple. Mm-hmm. Okay. I like that. I'll, t- I'll take that from, from this conversation already. Natalia, can you explain us a bit about uh, what your organization is? You're a representative of the FNV, the Network Group for Migrant Domestic Workers. What do you do? Uh, <coughs> uh, well, we are, uh, you say I'm a representative of FNV. Well, no, I'm not a representative of FNV. I'm the representative of the migrant domestic workers who, who, who are part of the FNV. We mm-hmm. as a group are the FNV. And um, we represent uh, domestic workers who clean houses uh, to Dutch households or expats. We uh, take care of the children. Um, and um, uh, all of us are migrants uh, from the Philippines, Africa, South America. 
all over the world and most of us are undocumented which uh, give, um, gives us a lot of uh, limitations mm. to, to live and um, to live and to work. The one, one of the only works that we can do is uh, how, uh, cleaning households and taking care of children. Um, um, yeah, um, we as a group feel very vulnerable because um, we feel like we, we are part of here because we are making it possible for um, the owners of the houses to go to the work. Uh, we take care of the children, uh, we take them to school, so we help them to be part of the society here in the Netherlands. And that makes us feel uh, useful and part of the Dutch society. But at the same part, uh, same time, we are also invisible mm -hmm. because we are always in the houses. Nobody sees us. We don't see uh, our colleagues. So it's also very hard to... Um, to to, um, how do you say, it? to unite, uni unite yeah. to organize with each other. And that is what we try to do as uh, migrant, our network migrant domestic workers, to, to uh, find those domestic workers here in the Netherlands who are all over the world, most in the big cities, um, and to try to um, make them feel that they are useful, that they exist, because most, be, uh, m most of the time, because they have um geëmigreerd and they migrated Mi they have mig migrated to the Netherlands they feel a kind of lost and they don't know what to do and the main focus of them is to um gain the money to send it back to home so it's the their mindset is surviving yeah. and we try that as network to to um to make them feel that they exist that they can uh, uh came come together and fight for their rights uh, here in the Netherlands, that they exist. Uh, because right now our work in the Netherlands is not uh, recognized. Our work as um, domestic work, huishoudelijk werk, is not recognized by the government. They allow us to work, but we don't exist and our work doesn't exist. So we try to, um, uh, we have been doing a fight over many, many years, more, more than 10 years to uh, ratify the convention C189 by the uh, International, International Labour Organization, um, who many countries have ratified, uh, uh, have signed, sorry, not ratified, mm. have signed. Uh, one of them is the Netherlands. They have uh, signed the, the treaty and they, uh, they were actually one of the um, sorry, my English is not very well. They have uh, the Netherlands is um, uh, the country who started this uh, convention so that it could exist. And once once it already uh, existed, they say, okay, we sign it, we we make mm. sure it existed, but we are not going to implement it in the Netherlands because our laws are okay and <laughs> our uh, say uh, uh, collective okay. bargainings are okay, so we are not going to do it. Yeah. And we as, as domestic workers uh, are trying to um, uh, implement this um, this convention and to put it on, on the agenda of the government. What, what, does, um, what would it mean exactly? The what would it, it mean? It would be ratified. It would, be, it would mean that uh, if they ratify it, 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 it would mean that they will, that the government has to change the law that right now is under Dienstverlening aan huis. Uh, they, they, should, they will have to change that and make it uh, right with, uh, with right uh, collect, with a correct collective uh, bargaining. Mm -hmm. So that the workers should have a minimum wage that they can uh, uh, make uh, social security yeah. because right now they don't have minimal wages. They they have not the security that they are going to be paid. They are have they have no vacation days. They have not they have no sick 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 days leave. Mm -hmm. They have nothing. And these are all like these are essential it's element to have exactly before you even can talk about maybe even feelings of belonging exactly because without that how can you ever feel welcome. Yeah. yeah, so we feel part of the Dutch society. We, uh, we don't have problems with our uh, employers. 
they treat us always very well but we for the it yeah. it it um so it's really like legal obstacles for you that, yeah. that really are in the way of feeling at home yes feeling really part of society yes because so because that would be almost like my stereotypical idea would be like but you are busy with working for to get money send it back home and then at a certain moment maybe you want to go back home right is but is that is that so or are many people here to stay to work to build a life um, also sending back money well the, you have two two kind of people you could say um, you have the people who come here and then their main focus is to send money back but because they have been here for so many time they want to start a life here mm -hmm. and then you also have people like me who my parents migrated to here and they worked as my domestic workers and I was able to um, do the whole education part and the integration part but then afterwards uh, when I was 18 I had to start working as a domestic worker because there's no chance yeah. so you have the two parts you have yeah. the, the, the and for you the Netherlands completely home well I don't really. I would say I'm not I'm not a Dutch person but I feel part of the society yeah. I think that's two different things yeah. and I think that's also uh, for many domestic yeah. workers uh, yeah. the feeling and if you would have these this legal basis would that completely change your feeling you think um, would it be a step to a different feeling it would be a step for us to feel more a bit more dutch but i think uh, for me at least it won't it will never be a a, a full uh, feeling of being dutch and what, like, besides the, the, the legal obstacles, which are huge, uh, I think, and, and you know, it sounds like you, you guys are fighting a big fight. Yes. Uh, what else is there th that could be done by, I, I don't know, just ordinary citizens like me, like us, to feel, to, m to make you feel more at home? To, uh, yeah. um, is there anything or are there already initiatives that do something? Well, for us as... Um, network as uh, organization of domestic workers um, the the chance to speak about our struggle because we don't often have that chance to speak about our struggle uh, gives us um, uh, a sort of support that we are being hurt, hurt, hurt by people that gives us some um, sentiment of uh, visibility that we that we exist and we may exist we we can be here mm -hmm. i mean the fact that we are standing here um i know that many of domestic workers who are also here present uh, they are they they must feel um happy that we that someone can stand here and talk about our issues mm -hmm. that that gives us a a, a feeling that we, we that we are progressing in our struggle so visibility is, is very important yes yeah. yes because um, if we don't let us uh, self hear uh, by um, for example they are academics they can talk about the migration about the uh, facts but they are not the migrants um, she is, <laughs> I'm a migrant. She is. <laughs> but different, I guess. <laughs> but it is I different. Yeah. 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 So let's go to the room, see if anybody has a question. Anybody? Okay, well, you get more time. Can I say a yeah, little thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because what, I've, what you said was very important. I think that uh, also in the introduction, uh, we were talking about identity and fluidity and we can choose uh, but what we find is that for a lot of people it's not a matter of choice mm. uh, yeah, it's really uh, I'm sure you would have chosen something very different the choices have been made by society by the state by the legal system but also by other things like how you look how we look upon you for example the high-skilled Indians they look to Dutch very similar as um, other, uh, let's say, uh, 
uh, labor migrants or perhaps uh, the, the Hindustani Surinamese. Mm. So we don't see differences, uh, which for themselves are very important. And uh, so people are framed by mm. outsiders also and put in certain boxes and we don't choose them. Yeah. Can I answer? Uh, yeah. uh, I, I think that's totally, uh, I totally agree with that because we have members uh, of the Philippines or the uh, or Indonesia who are very high uh, level educated. They have gone to the university in their home countries. Some are um, mathematicians. Uh, they are teach teachers of mathematicians in of universities, and they would like to apply uh, do that here, uh, but because they don't have a documentation, they don't have the Burger Service number, they cannot do that, yeah. and they speak excellent English English th that they could up, uh, teach in the universities, but they cannot do that, and their own their limitation is. You are undocumented, so you have to be a domestic worker and nothing else. So I, I think that's a, uh, that's a huge problem that we have here in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, last question then. Um, besides your fight for the, the ratification and implementation of this law, what else should change? What else should change? <laughs> 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 I think... Um, and can employers do something, for example, because you you start <coughs> up a very well, uh, I think very strong by saying, well, I mean, we clean the houses, we make sure that people can go to their work, we take care of their children. You're very much part of society, our daily lives. So, what about the employers? Do they have a our responsibility? Can they like at least help with the fight? Yes, the the our employers are our main uh, ally, 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 allies, allies, yeah. allies uh, in our fight because um, they they very often want to help us, but because of the legal laws, they they are not allowed. They are actually uh, right now they are strafbar, mm -hmm. punishable. Uh, yeah. They 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 crime? get fines. Yeah. Uh, they they could get fines of thousands and thousands of euros because we work for them. So if they join us in our join us in our struggle, that would be amazing because they are our employers. That where do you see that employers are working together with the with the workers to get a, a, a legal work? You never see that. You uh, mm -hmm. you always see a fight between employer and workers. Right? We are we, we, we as domestic workers want to work together with our employers so they can help us uh, to uh, make our work exist with our all the le legal um, yeah. legal Stuff. things. <laughs> yeah. the, the legal, legal hell. <laughs> so how do we find you online? Do we get your number? How can we sign up? Um, if, if you are uh, an employer, maybe, if you have... Uh, child that's been taken care of yeah of well like you, if you have if you self a have a, a domestic worker in your house taking care of your children or cleaning your house come to us we are here we will be all together you can find us with our church are you all wearing uh, the shirts uh i think oh, we okay, great i think so and they will know how to find and them. we are also on facebook yeah we are fmv migrant domestic workers and there you can find all our steps that we do through all the years um, doing our fights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, I will stand. So it's time for something completely uh, different. The intermezzo or open stage, actually. And as I said, you're all invited to share an experience. Um, but we also understand that, you know, it can be a bit intimidating if I ask you now well who wants to share anybody already no maybe not so we thought that and um, we decided to actually uh, invite someone to perform before um, so we have a great performer to kick off this open stage her name is Astira Mortezai she's an actress a performer director and a translator and she was born in Sakis Iran in Iranian Kurdistan and in her performance that she will do here 
Astera reflects on her arrival in the Netherlands and the unwelcoming nature of the Dutch immigration bureaucracy, the IND. So please give a warm round of applause for Astera. Why do you feel in danger? That is not enough. 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 Why do you feel in danger?
That is not enough. 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 That is not enough.
you very much, Astida. I have a bunch of questions for you, but I first have to go to the audience and see if they're ready. But you're here, right, for more questions. Quite an impressive um, performance of, I guess, feeling unwelcome, at least by our Dutch bureaucracy. You were just talking about Ter Apel, where all the asylum seekers who want to seek asylum in the Netherlands have to go to. This is probably the worst place you can think of in the Netherlands. I don't know if anybody of you have ever been there. Can I see a raise of hands? Every, anybody ever went to the Nulweg, the zero road in Ter Apel? Yeah, what's in the name, huh? The Zero Road. It's actually the road, what is called there, to, to go there. Um, so, anybody up for sharing his or her experience of feeling welcome, feeling at home, belonging in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands? Oh yeah, come up. I'm just going to give you the mic. Can you tell us who you are and then just tell whatever you want? Hi everyone, I'm Sanem. Uh, I'm from Istanbul. I was born and raised there and I uh, moved here uh, in August 2017 for my master's. Um, I'm actually a lawyer back home. I worked there for two years and then decided to come here to get a European law degree with the hopes that getting a job here, you know. Uh, but um, when I first came here, I was just like, um, everyone who I met, uh, they were like, how are you Turkish? How are you? How is your English so good? Why do you drink alcohol? Why do you smoke weed? I'm just like, you know what, guys? Like, there are people like me, you know? Like, I grew up in a very liberal family, non-conservative. And um, after I came here, it was very different to change my classmates' perspective, because all they see is Turkish Dutch people. And they just assume that I love Erdogan for some reason. And then another funny thing about that is, um, you know, here we have like Turkish markets and Turkish restaurants. Uh, sometimes like I like to go there to get like a local food, whatever. And whenever I go into a Turkish store, because I speak uh, without an accent or like just speak Istanbul Turkish, I get um, rejected by them too. Uh, they're just like, oh, okay, uh, liberal, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll just add on uh, extra 50 cents to, to her order. Because she's like, you know, <laughs> not supporting Erdogan. Uh -huh. So here I just don't know what to do. Like I'm not fully um, uh, accepted into the Dutch culture because they, I'm seen as Dutch Turkish. But um, when I try to become a part of my own community, I'm excluded again because I am a liberal Turk. So it's just in between. I just don't know what to do. Um, uh, I also have another story when I was applying for jobs. I applied to a law firm uh, after finishing my master's. And because on the website I saw there were some Turkish lawyers. And the response I get is, um, uh, sorry, we have enough, enough Turkish lawyers and there's no place for another one. And I'm like, okay guys, didn't know you had a quota, but um, sure, I'll just try to fill up another law firm's Turkish quota then. Um, so yeah, now I'm, I have like a temporary contract. Um, Hopefully, like, uh, I need to get a permanent one to stay, or else I'll be shipped back off. But, um, but you want to stay in? in yeah, yeah, Netherlands? definitely. I mean, you know, there's not much for me back home, so I just I hope I can make it here. So I yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing your story. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, yeah, please come up. Hi everybody, I'm a stranger, oh sorry, Shadi. <laughs> but true, I'm a stranger. I'm a stranger forever, because the more I integrate in the Dutch culture, the far I go from my own culture. Mm. Three, years, three years, after three years coming to the Netherlands, a cousin came and visited me. He says, Shadi, I don't see a Yemenis anymore, so I'm from Yemen. Mm. I, and uh, whenever I hang out with my Dutch friends, I'm still also the Yemenis guy, so who am I? I don't know what I feel. I feel so confused. I feel, what I feel is about myself, but I have my own identity. I'm creating my own identity, and I want to feel accepted by my own difference. 
I want others to celebrate my differences rather than to bring me to be a copy of a certain culture. So I hear always integration, integration, integration. For the Dutch government, I'm already integrated. I had my Burkhane exam. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not. I'm actually not. Because still, for my Dutch friends, I'm still the Yemeni guy. And I think what brings us all to the city is that the dream or the idea of celebrating our differences rather than forcing everybody to be a copy of the Dutch people with all the respect for the Dutch people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Who else? Yeah, come on. Oh, no, oh, what? Oh, yeah. That's also okay. A question. Can you stand up and ask a question? Well, I hear a lot of uh, integration, um, but I was wondering, is a sense of belonging, is it about integration, or? Mm, and who do we ask this to? Is <laughs> a sen having a sense of belonging about integration? Who has an answer to that? Just ask in the, the room, you? Anybody? You have an answer to that? Well, Maybe? Not an not idea? <laughs> Can you pass on the mic? Could you stand up, please? Oh. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> well, I don't think that uh, integration has necessarily something to do with a sense of belonging. But more than an answer, I kind of had a different story that I wanted to share that was more like, um, I was born in Italy, but I'm Moroccan, but my parents are Moroccan. And I, the first time that I felt Italian was when I came for the first time here in the Netherlands. And I lived in this small, small village in that's called Houghton, the Dutch people might know. <laughs> and uh, I, it was this high school exchange. And I lived with this Dutch family that kept asking questions about my culture. And then the fact that I wasn't in Italy made me realize how much Italian I was all of a sudden, because the Dutch saw me as an Italian, all of my habits and stuff. And it was really weird, because in Italy, I'm not Italian at all. I'm a full Moroccan. And then I came here again as a master's student. I'm doing this master that it's very international and all the people, there's hardly any Dutch people in our class. And all of a sudden I'm treated as this expert who has different uh, backgrounds, is very exotic, has this and that. And it's just so weird because it really depends on what you do and where you are and the people that surround you. And I think that kind of gives you a sense of belonging within your local or your community rather than the whole integration policies that are a bit too forced and don't really follow what the process, like a personal process that you have. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers. Thank you, Noel. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Anybody else? Last experience? Could you come up? Thanks. There you go. I actually did want to say something about belonging and integration. Um, I am Dutch. My uh, family is Dutch. I've been Dutch all my life. I was born with the Dutch nationality, but I've never lived in the Netherlands until I came here to, to study at the university mm. uh, because my parents travel around for my father's work. And uh, now I often get the question uh, from other Dutch people, uh, where are you from? And they <laughs> expect to get, oh yes, I'm from Amsterdam, or I'm from Rotterdam, or any other city that I don't know, because I don't know many cities here. Um, <laughs> and so despite the fact that I'm fully Dutch and I don't need to integrate, I don't feel like I belong necessarily anywhere in the Netherlands. Mm. And it's a strange feeling, <laughs> because even when I've lived in other places, uh, places where I definitely didn't belong in that sense, um, I felt more at home than I do now in which is some supposed to be my own country. And, and what countries did you live, for example? Um, um, I was born in Singapore, and then my parents moved to Malaysia, and then we moved to Nigeria. Um, I moved inside Nigeria as well, and then we moved to the Middle East, and then I came back here for university. And how long have you been here now? 
I've been here now for eight years. Eight years. Yeah. And you so and you don't really feel no at home. No. No. Mm -hmm. I I mean I feel at home. I have a, a nice house and <laughs> I have <laughs> and I I have yeah. I have a, a, a I have a relationship and it's you know it's like I have made a home yeah. but yeah, it's yeah. not like if you were to ask me like where are you at home like yeah. go back to the place where you belong then I would have not even a single answer. Not also not one of the countries that you grew up in. No, no, because I in all of those countries I was an expat yeah. and I never integrated there. Definitely not. Um I never learned any tribal languages while I lived in Nigeria and I definitely learned no Arabic when I was living in um the United Arab Emirates. So going back there is well also for me personally not exactly possible because of my um sexual identity. Mm. So it's it's complicated. And do you feel like you're missing out because you don't have that sense of belonging? I recognize it in other people and I am jealous of it. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I mean I'm richer for it by the experience, obviously. Like I'm I am I am immensely privileged to have seen the world, but you win some, you lose some. You win some, you lose some, yes. I don't <laughs> think I would do this to my own children. No? No. Okay, interesting. <laughs> interesting. All right, well thank you. Thank, thank you, you for sharing. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, well, you want to share or you have a question? Oh, okay. Oh. All right. Okay, last question, then we'll move on to the yeah. next Very quick question you because okay. Eddie here is also the illustrator or designer of our magazine, Are We Your Magazine. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> he makes those beautiful covers. So now that you're a part of a collective that's called Are We Europe, and I hear you've lived in a lot of places which aren't Europe. Yes, yeah. Do you feel European then? Rather than Dutch, is that more oh, an yes, identity definitely. that you would share? Yes, yes, yes. One, yeah, one hundred percent. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that's Thank good. you, mate. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to share? Yes, just would very you like briefly. to stand up? Um, maybe I can stand up from here. Yeah, that's it's also okay. fine. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Irish. <laughs> <laughs> I am Irish. <laughs> No, but why, uh, I mean to say, you know, different uh, expressions on your faces when I say that. But, well, originally, maybe what you want me to, to hear me say is, originally I was born and raised in the Philippines. <laughs> I took on Irish uh, nationality because my stepfather was Irish and my whole family moved to Ireland. And now I'm living in the Netherlands. <laughs> so I'm a bit confused myself. <laughs> But um, no, um, what I wanted to say was I wanted to do, to react to the to the four to the speakers that were here earlier, because I think that they brought up a lot of very serious questions that we as a society have to really um, look at. One is, um, you know, I heard about knowledge migrants. So it seems like Dutch in Dutch society there are some who are more equal than others. And uh, does this mean that because knowledge migrants have a different set of rights? They do. Um, but yet we have also undocumented migrant workers who do as valuable a work and contribute meaningfully to Dutch society. So why do they have a different set of rights or no rights at all? So that's the first point that I want to say. Um, the second point is um, rights ensure integration and belongingness, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, for a lot of um, the people from my family, uh, from, from not from my family, but from my community who, who are undocumented, if they had more rights, then they would definitely feel yeah. more integrated and would feel more belongingness and acceptance in Dutch society. So rights are very important to ensure this. Thirdly, um, rights for domestic workers here in the Netherlands are being advanced by undocumented migrant domestic workers. So in fact, the work that the Migrant Domestic Workers Union of the FNV, uh, what we are doing in that union, is really advancing the rights of, undocu of documented domestic workers in the Netherlands. Mm. So, you know, um, give credit where credit is due. We are not you know, looking for a tap on the back and that sort of thing, but we are working for the greater good and for the greater rights of everyone in this society. Uh, and I think that that has to be recognized and valued. Um, fourth, <laughs> uh, that choice and options regarding staying or leaving have to be guaranteed by the government. 
you know, uh, what, like when you were asking earlier about, you know, are you coming, are you staying, or are you leaving? That has to be a choice. Mm -hmm. That has to be a free choice, and that is a right. That right to choose and to have options in life have to be guaranteed by rights and have to be given by governments. No? And lastly, lastly, and most important, <laughs> uh, is that we need to address the root causes of forced migration. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of our people, uh, migration is not a choice. We are forced to migrate because of circumstances back home. And I think you need to look at your own societies in terms of what Dutch multinational corporations are doing in our countries mm -hmm. of origin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A lot of good points. Very, very good points, I think. Are you going to be around later so people can come up to you to talk to you more? Yeah, all right. That's good to know. I just wanted to come back to our performer. Uh, Astida, could you stand up? Because, well, I was really impressed. Uh, we were just talking a little bit uh, before, uh, well, the evening started. I just wanted to know, like, I mean, this felt very unwelcoming, the IND. Um, but how has your experience been for the rest since uh, you've been here? When, when did you come? What happened? Uh, okay, so it's... Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> I thought my voice is uh, loud enough uh, to talk, but mm, it seems... Just no. <laughs> be sure. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a big decision that uh, when you leave your country, uh, so it's true that uh, you don't choose. You have to, and uh, you want a decision is here that you want to continue, like you did before, because for me in my country, because of uh, stopping of doing any activity, and doing art and anything, uh, for me was like that. I lost my vitality. I I was not alive anymore. So I think here. Little by little, I can uh, I can feel it. Uh, uh, I I uh, I came back to life, but you know uh, when you come, uh, uh, you go to a place north of Netherlands, part from everywhere, and you don't know where is it. It's, it was like a movie for me. A line of people with suitcases were going to somewhere that. They don't know where is that. I didn't know where to go, and I just followed people. So, okay, let's follow people. Uh, you know, uh, it was like, you ha don't have to say anything. Just say your name, your identity. St uh, stay in this room, isolated, till we inform you. And during this time, always we were waiting for a paper, for a letter. Do you have post today? No, I don't have post today. Maybe tomorrow. I don't know where where this godo comes and uh, gives you this post. You know, it was very hard. The hardship was there because you have to wait all the time and you don't have to ask. Don't ask any question till we inform you. And they inform, they inform you one day that you have interview. And interview is something that you consume all cellules of your body because you have to concentrate. You should sleep well in a camp that people, f with different people, that they don't have interview, all of them. And uh, during the, the night, you don't sleep. But uh, the interview is a very long thing that's during five till seven hours a day. And sometimes more than one interview. It's about, s for me, was four interview, different four interview. And all of all the time, I had to talk about my history, why I am here. So tell us. Then uh, I had a lot of documents because uh, I am an artist and I did uh, clandestine work and uh, underground works in Iran. Uh, for European people, underground doesn't have the meaning that uh, <laughs> in my country because the underground is here. Is something uh, against gallery, you know, something that, uh, yeah. But in my country, is uh, you should be completely rebel against the country government. I am underground artist, you know, so it's very dangerous. It's like that. Any time you are waiting for police knocking on the door, what are you doing? Oh, let's see these people gathering together, doing art, dance, and uh, talking about the body of a woman. 
But uh, the experience staying in the camp, it, I, I was lucky, really lucky. I didn't stay a long time in camp. But uh, you know, it's very hard because, uh, because of waiting, because you don't know you are allowed to stay or not. And you are thinking about the future. What, sh what, what's, what happens to me? Should I back, go back? What happens if I go back? And uh, you know, that uh, the process is like that you should prove that you are in danger in your country. If you are not in danger in your country, they will send you back to your country. And being in danger some th has just specific meanings for this bureaucratic uh, system. Uh, it's bomb directly comes, <laughs> yeah, or police is following you. And if you go back, they arrest you, they hang you, or they kill you. So this is the meaning of danger. And uh, I just thought about it. What is the meaning of danger for different people here in this camp? They left their country, their life, everything behind. And it needs a lot of courage to do that, because it's not easy, really. Maybe many people think it's very easy. OK, you have your suitcase, you go to, uh, to find a better life. But uh, it's not easy. Uh, then you come and you should prove what they like to say. Mm -hmm. You are here for other reasons. But what? We never heard about this. This case is doesn't uh, look. It's like that they, they look at uh, their uh, documents. No, it doesn't exist for us. There is no war in your country, for example. The police didn't arrest you. And uh, so you, you can stay at home don't have activity, nothing happens. Yep. So it is, that's, that's, uh, the performance is about the meaning of danger for different people, not only for me. It, it is not, uh, maybe you live in Europe, maybe you are European, and you go to an, uh, one of these office, it happens for everybody. Mm -hmm. You cannot prove, and uh, uh, yeah. Well, thank Sorry. you very, very much, Estida, <laughs> for sharing that. <laughs> And you will also be here huh? okay, to talk more. Okay, so quickly let's move on to our next panel. I'd like to invite our guests to talk about the next um, topic of the night, and that's, are Muslims the new Jews? Well, that's a question. Um, we will talk about it with Lodi van der Kamp. Please join with me at the table. He's a co-founder of Said and Lodi, former rabbi, and co-author of the book Over Muren Heen, which will be published in April, I heard. Um, then we have... Uh, Umima, um, Al Abdelawi, uh, co author also of Over Muren Heen, and Edwin van der Schur, uh, founder and director of A Dare to Be Great. And again, before we talk, let's listen shortly to uh, um, a sh an excerpt of the article that was written and published uh, for Are We Europe magazine with the title um, Are Muslims the New Jews? And it's uh, written and also read by Kevin Sachs. So let's start by listening. Are today's European Muslims the Jews of yesteryear? Hi, my name is Kevin Sachs and I was born and raised in Zurich, Switzerland, in Zurich's Jewish community. And today I live and work in Toronto, Canada. Bans on religious dress and customs, burnt out homes and community centres, open hostility on the street and in the halls of parliament. Random checks by law enforcement. I'm not talking about what life was like for Western European Jews in the late 1800s or the 1930s, but about day-to-day -day realities for European Muslims over the past two decades. In 2006, Paul Silverstein a professor of anthropology at Reed College wrote about post 9-11 realities for Muslims, saying that in contemporary Western societies, Muslims are the object of a series of stereotypes, caricatures and fears which are not based in a reality and are independent of a person's experience with them. If you replace Muslim with the word Jew here, you get a relatively serviceable definition of anti-Semitism. In at least a few noticeable ways, Muslims have become the new Jews, scapegoats unto whom Europeans tend to project their anxieties about the future. 
Conservative and far-right politicians constantly intensify and exploit these anxieties in order to enhance nationalist agendas. This is, of course, not a new phenomenon. Europe's migrant skeptical populist right wing has a long tradition of fear-mongering against the newest group of immigrants. But since Muslims have been Europe's largest migrant and immigrant community since the mid-1990s, the radical right wing has not even had to shift its core message in over 20 years. If Muslims are, in fact, Europe's newest Jews, that does not mean that there has been an effective passing of the torch from anti-Semitism to Islamophobia. From the high-profile attack on a mosque in Pittsburgh, to the UK Labour Party's spate of scandals, to the beneath-the-surface presence of anti-Semitic attacks in France, Jew hatred is alive and well and not confined to just European shores. The debate on the interconnection of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia is extensive and emotional, but most importantly, it's relevant. The last decade has shown an increase in fear and insecurity among both Muslim and Jewish communities in Western Europe, a place supposedly known in the 21st century as a bastion of respect, tolerance and peace. There are plenty of good arguments that try to differentiate between the two types of discrimination, but in the end, their commonality is that they affect communities seen as the other. The other. So let's um, first just start with the title of this uh, article, Are Muslims the New Jews? Can you respond to that? Do you agree? Um, when we're talking about fear, I'm afraid so. When we talk about reality, and let's keep it, I want to keep it to the Dutch society or even Amsterdam society, uh, is Holland is a very safe country. With uh, Amsterdam, over 104,000 Muslims in this town. There's about 15 to 20,000 Jews here. Um, there is no religious organization that preaches anti-Semitism. There's no political fraction who preaches anti-Semitism. There's no school, no educational authority who pretend to listen. That's all in Holland. Mm. Uh, there is fear, but when we look at reality, I move about, I always, I always walk in, in uniform. The way I'm sitting here, I walk on the streets. And of course, I know if I meet the wrong person at the wrong moment, at the wrong spot, in the wrong company, then, well, something can happen to me. Mm. But it doesn't only happen to me as Jew, that happens to a, to a homo, that happens to a women, woman, that happens to any pa anybody who's vulnerable in society or could be vulnerable in society. That creates fear. And I've been working now for many years uh, within the Muslim community, in the Moroccan community, the Turkish community here in, in, in Holland, and I sense the same kind of of situation, yes, there might be fear, and of course there are attacks, and when there is fear, one has to address to it, and when there is danger, one has to address to it. When there is a threat of uh, terrorism, either on synagogues or, or, or mosques or whatever it is, one has to address to it. But that does not uh, justify a picture which is p uh, painted also from our own Jewish mm -hmm. community, that it is dangerous to live here and we can't, ride, we can't walk on the street with a yarmulke and a hat, etc. That's just not true. It only, uh, it only creates more and more fear. So in that sense, also the title of an article like that might feed into that fear, you feel? Like saying, like, are Muslims the new Jews? As if... Yes, we have to, we have, we have to be very much more sensitive to the fact that the more you create a, a picture, a gloomy picture, it creates more and more fear. Mm. Uh, and of course, I know our synagogues are being protected by armed uh, police officers, and our schools are. And now the mayor of Amsterdam just said, well, we have to do something about That is to protect against terrorism. To do something about the mosque as well. Yeah. Yeah. But she that's not against the, 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 the regular the society around us. Umema, how do you feel about that? In my opinion, I think um, Muslims and Jews are, in fact, in many ways the same. Uh, first of all, we have uh, many things in common as uh, we look into our religion. Uh, we are both, uh, we both have uh, an Abrahamic religion. We have mostly the same prophets and we believe in the same God. And um, if we <coughs> go back in history, we see that um, the Jews are, were discriminated in the past 
uh, and so were the Muslims. Uh, the Jews had a genocide, we all know, uh, was led by um, <coughs> Hitler. And the Muslims also had one in uh, 14, uh, 1492 uh, in Spain when they were driven away uh, from uh, Andalusia by uh, Queen, Fer uh, Queen um, Isabel and Ferdinand. Um, so we have a lot of things in common and um, the thing that is frightening the Muslim youth these days are um, the is the fact that <coughs> we have the bad things also in common like Jews were discriminated because uh, before um, uh, Hitler started the war and uh, the Muslims are also being discriminated right away and they're being seen as misfits and they don't seem to belong uh, in society um, and as they um, and as they are getting this etiquette um, we are also afraid of um, the fact that the history is repeating itself or it might be repeating itself. Like uh, the Netherlands is a really safe country, but you also have some crazy lunatics like uh, politicians who have the... <laughs> like <laughs> politicians <Yeah>. in general. Naida. <laughs> 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 we have the audacity to discriminate in public mm. and uh, then we have also some weird laws who make it... Um, okay to do that uh, for example uh, freedom of speech letting someone make a video which is um, really islamophobic mm -hmm. and making someone like that go to court and not getting the right um, justice isn't being served in the right way so um, i think the muslim youth is really afraid of the history repeating itself like it did with the jews and how does that that stereotyping uh, affecting feelings of belonging, of feeling at home, uh, the, yeah, the youth, as you said. How does that influence them? Well, I think the Muslim youth has um, a problem in the Netherlands. When you uh, look into, uh, when you zoom onto the, into this case, you see that uh, the Dutch community is like the Dutch community and it has its own morals and uh, values. And um, the Muslim community is like a new thing. And because there is so ma uh, many um, stereotyping in the media, for example, and there's the stigma putting um, being placed on the Muslim youth, um, we, the Muslim youth, are being seen as a new thing, but this new thing um, is being seen as something that is dangerous and scary, which isn't always true, which, uh, which is mostly not true. <laughs> <laughs> mostly. <laughs> uh, and um, <coughs> because we're being stereotyped, uh, um, and there's it w this one-sided reporting, and we're uh, being put down as bad people, uh, there is a prejudgment. So when the Muslim youth tries to um, fit in the Dutch community, there's already this, this prejudgment and um, they will never be seen as equal. There will always be uh, some kind of misfits. And when this happens, um, the Muslim youth starts to feel rejected, in my opinion. Um, Can you feel, give an example? In what way do you feel rejected? Feeling rejected by, um, it doesn't matter how, mu how much you try, uh, like, okay, if you, um, if you do something good, is being appreciated, but uh, you will always be that Muslim person. But if it's good and it's positive, you will also be uh, considered as um, a Dutch Muslim, and they will be, and the Dutch community will be proud to have you and. Um, it's really proud but when you do something bad um, you're automatically a muslim and maybe connected to isis mm. and uh, probably going to bad places and things like that and that is the feeling of uh, feeling rejected and as muslim youth uh, experience these things um, there comes a moment after the rejection rejection uh, they realize it doesn't matter how much they try, they will never be the same. And as that happened, the human mind works really easy. The human mind is always looking for a safe place to go. And if they don't find that safe place in the Dutch community, they go find it somewhere else. 
And where do they, f and do they find it? They find it in uh, other people who also feel rejected and um, neglected by the uh, Dutch community. So as that happened, all these people start to huddle together with n negative emotions, anger, resentment, um, and they start to create a rebellious attitude against the Dutch community because they don't accept us anyway. So it doesn't matter what we do. We don't care about the state. We don't care about the mm -hmm. Dutch community. I don't give... So Europe or the Netherlands doesn't feel as home even though we're born here. Mm. So that's it. And so we, I guess we all know the examples of politicians who feed into that. Who yeah, I think it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. <laughs> what, what initiatives are there that you see that are trying to counterbalance that? Are there any? Um, could you give examples of that? For example, um, projects who are being set up. For example, the book we are writing. Yeah, I over muren heen. Over muren heen. Or over um, walls. Oh, yeah. looking over Longer walls. Over walls. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think uh, that is a way to um, to mingle in the Dutch community um, in a way that it's explain you're explaining yourself without having to give an explanation, and um, in this way. Um, what, what exactly is the book about? Can you tell us a little bit more? Um, I understand we have to go and buy it, but just, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the 3rd of April, I uh, expect everyone to um, wait at the Bruna. <laughs> okay, yeah, 3rd of April, Bruna. 3rd of April, okay. Bruna, over Mure heen. Um, Lodi, do you want to explain well, it? It's a correspondence between Omer and me about uh, our lives, our backgrounds, our history, our look at society, of view of society, how the Jew looks as our Muslim in Holland, and how the Muslim looks at the Jews, how we attend to the Christian part of society, or the non-religious part of society, about uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and of course also, we give our reflections on the conflict Palestine-Israel, mm. and many other items. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, the buck but also uh, Said and Lodi's foundation, which is really active, um, underneath the Muslim youth and the Dutch community and mingling it, o mingling it all together uh, is a way to mingle in the Dutch community and I think it's also really important to not forget about the Muslim youth who is improving uh, itself within the Netherlands. So many uh, university students, so many doctors, lawyers, everything, it's, it's coming up and um, you can't deny that. Should there be more like media attention to that, for example? Should we yeah, make I an effort to, to show those good examples in, uh, ex ex instead of just focusing on the bad ones? Yeah, right? there definitely should be more attention to that because, um, as Lodi always <laughs> says, uh, bad news is no news. Uh, good news is no news. Bad news is news and juicy and things like that. Like it's really easy to only focus uh, on the bad thing uh, things that happen with the Muslim Jews and uh, youth. <laughs> 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 um, um, yeah. But I think it's also really important to focus on the good things to make these people um, um, to give these people a chance uh, to. Um, explore themselves and uh, prove itself I within the community. And I think uh, the Muslim youth is um, a great catch for the Dutch community. Mm -hmm. And um, you're also working on an initiative to sort of counterbalance mm -hmm. all this negativity, this stereotyping. Can you tell us a bit about your, uh, uh, your work? Yeah, so I uh, co-founded Dare to be Grey. I'm not the director as well. My co-worker would, would kill me if he would see this. <laughs> um, we were founded in 2016, um, which was mostly a reply against, in the beginning of 2016, just after the attacks in Brussels and in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and what set, up, set us up the most wasn't the attacks themselves as much as the response that we saw in society happening. And that was uh, what we are with Dare to be Grey and what our campaign is is a, uh, a call to go beyond black and white thinking, to go beyond polarization, beyond uh, us versus them narratives. And um, that's what you see. I would say that polarization is something that's always been there. It's, I would even say it's part of like the human condition. 
Um, but now we are living in times that we see uh, increase uh, increase of hate speech, increase of uh, discrimination incidents. We are living in a time where it's it's this polarization is crystallizing in a new way, uh, partly due to the internet. So where in mo many cases we can see the internet as a very positive kind of thing, and that's what we with Dead Speak also try to be because we are mostly on the internet. Um, there's also a lot of negative things that have arisen uh, from that, from social media, from um, all those kinds of dynamics and, and algorithms and stuff. So how do you try to counter that then? Exactly? We, we dare people to be gray. Um, and uh, well, what do we mean, mean with gray? Gray is like literally, you know, the color that's between black and white, between the absolutes, between those, those narratives of good versus evil and us versus them and embracing uh, gray, not just as this, as this color, but as a, a, a social group, a identity that embraces empathy and diversity. You know, there are a lot of different shades or colors of gray. There's been a book written about it. Um, <laughs> and uh, not necessarily the kind of book we would recommend in this specific case, but... Um, and, to, you know, to dare people speak out and, and take this... Uh, because polarization, uh, as was mentioned, as, as well, is it, it's um, it's something about attention. Uh, the more attention we give to extremism, or uh, you know, the worst case scenario, terrorism, you know, the, the, it feeds on that. The, the stronger it gets, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not to say that we should ignore it completely or pretend that it, it isn't there. But the amount of attention we give it is disproportionate, especially on social media nowadays. Mm -hmm. And that's what Dare to be Grey by, you know, having this platform for grey identity, people to speak out for this, you know, the good stuff, the good stuff that's going on and the way we are actually connecting and the way we are celebrating uh, diversity and differences of opinion. Um, we try to give that more attention. So, but like, do I go onto your website and like, how do I get to be grey? Well, I, um, like what you do can I ask the question. It goes by itself. <laughs> it just goes by itself. Yeah, it yeah. Goes yeah. By itself. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, you know, we, we try to spearhead yeah. this this movement online on you know Facebook, Instagram. Look us up. Um, it's not much now, but we are about to relaunch very soon, and we you know join a movement by speaking out. You know, personally going into those debates, not constantly trying to find the negatives and things you disagree on, but find the stuff you do agree on. Uh, you know, part of um, living in a great society and you know, living in a democratic society is also accepting that there are differences, that we don't agree on everything. We don't need to agree on Israel or Palestine, but we can agree on the fact that we need to live together here and make something out of it. Um, and that doesn't... Um, we, you know, and if you want to be great, you can join us online on the movement, but it's also something very personal. You just... It's like Do an attitude. It's an attitude, yeah. Mm. It's um, and maybe an identity even. Maybe uh, even a lifestyle? A yeah, lifestyle. definitely. It's, and it's um, what I've noticed whilst I was working with the HBQ, I've been doing it for the past three years. Um, polarization is about attention. It's about how much attention do we give it as a society, but also on a very individual level. Um, I studied international relations, so when you study that, you, you know, your focus goes always to the conflicts that are going on there. And it made me kind of depressed a lot of the times. Like, well, there's a lot of shit going on there. Especially now, you know. You um, mm -hmm. can only need to look across the canal, basically. Um, and by doing that to be great, and actually, like, making portraits and doing interviews of people who are doing all this amazing stuff of bringing people together, um, it, you know, it really lightened my personal mental health as well, basically. And so it, it needs to happen on various levels, both on a society-wide society level as on an individual kind of level. You, you can do that by joining our movement online, but, it, you know, it's more than that. <laughs> but do it yourself as well. Yeah, definitely. Just come back to, to your uh, initiatives. Um, you also have a, um, well, a company, an initiative, together with Said Ben Saddam, um, called Said and Lodi, yes, sir. Um, which also is trying to bring your communities together and maybe overcome certain stereotypes that live within the communities about each other? Uh, well, we, start, we started on the, on, on the topic of Jews and Muslims together, but uh, slowly, slowly over the years, we came both to the conclusion that uh, more and more the two communities get together, get to know each other, there is no problem between the communities. Mm. 
that's so interesting in itself, eh? because yes. it's often portrayed it as if there are. That's many. right, right, that's yeah. right. Uh, I would say we thrive by the threat of anti Semitism, that we thrive on it, but uh, let's keep to the facts. Let's keep, mm. yes. Mm. And there are incidents, and these incidents are, are, are being dealt with, and that's it. In a society with a million Muslims here in Holland and 30,000 Jews, well, they happen to meet each other. <laughs> and 99% uh, of these meetings are very pleasant, and sometimes they are not pleasant. Yeah. These things happen. Uh, we have shifted more, uh, much more towards the uh, mainly youngsters from Moroccan origin, Turkish origin, um, Antillians, who feel of being made felt second-class citizens, mm -hmm. who are being uh, discriminated uh, in, in, in uh, obtaining work, uh, who have got a very poor self image very often because of the situation, because of the, the, the noise that is produced in The Hague towards these communities. Yeah. And we are uh, working with these youngsters to, to, to encourage them to work onto the future. And that's, uh, so you really shifted from finding a solution of the problems between the communities, they're not really there, to doing something for different groups. Slowly, slowly, yeah. because uh, one, once, once we are in contact with the communities uh, and we work together within, within no, all right, within the uh, Muslim community, they recognize us and we recognize them yeah. as, uh, as yeah. citizens in this country yeah. without problems. And do you share the same feelings of belonging or disbelonging among each other? If you talk about uh, how you interact in Dutch society, do you uh, have the same experiences? We Are have been living here, my family has been living here about 350 years. Mm -hmm. So I think I feel belonging here. There's always minor moments, I tell you just an example. Mm -hmm. uh, I was invited for dinner here tonight to join you all. Mm -hmm. And then I was asked, uh, like everyone was asked, have you got any requirements re in respect of, 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 of a um, uh, we call it an, uh, requirements for dinner. Requirements for dinner, yeah. So I said, yes, I eat kosher. <laughs> so, oh, uh, sorry, uh, we, we cannot accommodate that. What? I've been living for 350 years <laughs> in the town of Amsterdam. Mm. There's kosher shops all over the place, or restaurants. And the simple thing, we can't accommodate that. Mm. Yeah? No hard feelings. Yeah. But, but then, you said, then you think, hey, that no only, only happens to me. Yeah. And that's... <laughs> it's a very minor thing by not feeling at home because the, 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 the issues we've, we've heard here tonight about not feeling right, from to total different order. Yeah. But, uh, but that's, it brings me to my, my, my that last issue. question. Yeah. It's like, what can we all do to make everybody feel more at home? So, I mean, accommodate that, right? If you mm -hmm. know, if you invite a guest who you might, well, if you ask him, what can we do? Why well, eat kosher? Accommodate that. Mm -hmm. um, but but maybe all other things. What can we all do, like us as citizens well, of the city? I feel I feel sometimes not at home when I saw the acts of our guests here tonight. That's our Dutch I and D, mm -hmm. and I've been at the Apple if we go there, and I've been in the uh, as as I say in in in, in the south of Amsterdam, that's in south of Spain. But you visit there that you see children there, families with children who come straight from Aleppo or other war zones, children traumatized like anything. Yeah. And then in our country, we are not able to supply these families of these children with a psychiatrist who comes in once in the three weeks. And then one psychiatrist for the whole, for the whole place. Then, then uh, yeah, I don't always feel at home anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me look at the room if you have any questions for our guests. Oh, okay. Let me stand up and give you the mic. Start with you, then you. Can you stand up? Um, I have one question for uh, you, Lodi. Uh, the um, said and Lodi um, initiative. Is there a reason you focus on Muslim and Jews instead of like including other religions that, for example, have the same belief in God or whatever? Uh, we uh, address to anybody in society. But it happens to be uh, when we, 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 work, uh, we work on the request of the Amsterdam municipality or the public prosecu prosecutor's office or the, the local police, and then we are sent to hotspots where there are real issues going on, mm. where schools sometimes can't cope anymore with the situation. And well, the, the fact is, 
that there are many Muslims in these classes, but other also minority uh, or other minorities, and also Dutch kids. So called them Dutch kids. I mean, they're all Dutch kids, but. Yes, uh, Miss uh, Abdelawi, <coughs> it's a bit uh, depressing. Okay, it's a bit depressing story, uh, what you were telling, and, and I get a bit <laughs> pessimistic out of it. In my youth, I uh, had some Moroccan friends. We uh, chased girls, we drank beer, they chased their wives, their girlfriends, <laughs> and so on. And for me, as a Dutch uh, citizen, citizen, and especially in Amsterdam with, with a liberal and tolerated mindset, I hope so. I feel ri f uh, very disappointed that we are moving the, that the, no, yeah, let's say the Moroccan or not you Turkish people, but they are getting more, more and more religious, and that is the downside of it. Because we, in let's say, I was a naive person, maybe in the 80s, 90s. I thought everyone who is a refugee or everyone who's coming to Holland can be an an extra. But the thing is that people uh, turned more and more religious. That gave me a very unpleasant feeling because I had to uh, get loose from, let's say, a Christian environment. And now I'm here and I'm confronted with also that, uh, how say, I to look, uh, uh, signs like a, sc a scarf or even Miss, uh, Mr. Van der Kamp, uh, Keppel. Okay, and that gives me the feeling that there are too many boundaries. And I have a solution for uh, open up things and that everyone can feel more connected, but maybe it's a bridge too far that it's inter-religious uh, relations, inter-religious love relations. Yeah. <laughs> interesting. Okay, interesting point. The solution, inter-religious yeah. love relations. May, yeah. ask, may I ask what's the reason you feel unpleasant with... No, no, Oh, I was also disappointed by my story, but I can't come <laughs> over here and tell a lie, right? I'm just telling my, uh, I'm just telling a story over here, uh, which comes from my own experiences, and importantly, I can't change them. Okay, but um, um, the, interreligious yep. love stories, yeah, maybe it will work <laughs> for some people, but the next uh, book. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. We have some rulings, you know. <laughs> okay, it's I'm really hard. I'm gonna move to the next question. Can you stand up? Yeah. Hello, my name is Faisal. I'm from Indonesia. I'm a Muslim. Also, I'm uh, undoc uh, domestic worker. Uh, what I say is uh, the Dutch community is very respect with me. If I have a time for praying, they say, okay, Faisal, you should take uh, 10 minutes for praying. In the Ramadan time, they always ask me to take a rest, maybe 15 minutes before I work to clean their house. So they are very, very respect to me, and I respect to them. And then uh, in the Eid al-Fitri, usually some people or uh, maybe other people doesn't give me anything, but the, the Dutch, uh, especially my com uh, the Dutch community that I know, they give me like a present and they support me and they always say, good thing you are here, this is a present for you, happy sacrifice, they, they say. Yeah, and uh, for now, if you see in uh, Indonesian mosque, more Dutch people coming, and more people, uh, Dutch people become a Muslim, because they are knowing that the Islam is a good, and they respect it, and we are also respect them. So if we respect each other, and I think we can give a peace moment for us, that means respect. That's why. Uh, that's my experience. Thank you very much. That's perception. Huh? Thank you. Can I short, uh, short reaction? Yeah, short, and then we're we'll moving. Well, to the not necessarily a reaction, but something that was uh, on my mind, especially something that triggered me in the last rounds, where where a couple of you in the audience uh, came with, you know, this question about belonging and identity, um, and it really triggered me in a positive way. Um, also trying to link it to this discussion on polarization because I feel like uh, there's a connection to be seen. The fact that 
polarization is such a big topic and can be so heated. Um, polarized debates are usually debates about identity, about cultural identity. Mm. Uh, polarization isn't happening on some kind of very specific bureaucratic law, unless that law has to do with uh, the FMV, with identity in the end. And you see that identity and polarization, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, is comparing us versus them. Because when do people start saying that they feel more belonging to a specific identity, it's when you start comparing it to someone else. When you start comparing it to someone you initially um, don't consider a part of that identity. And I feel Dutch when I talk to someone from France or from England. I feel European when I talk to an American. And that's like the positive, uh, positive side of it. Like, you know, I have this positive story about my background, um, be, being Italian or whatever. But that's also where polarization is coming from. That's the other side of it, where you need people need that confirmation of their own identity. The, you only get it by comparing that to someone else. And when that switches to something very negative, like I, that other person is lesser than me, that's where the downward spiral starts, basically. So, should, so, be, so let's say, if you think of dare to be gray as a mm -hmm. lifestyle, um, be aware of the shifting identities and your privilege to do that? Yeah, and don't, don't, don't ignore identity. Like, identity is very important to us. It's probably one of the most fundamental things we, we have uh, as an individual or as a society. So our message is definitely not ignoring your background or ignoring your identity, but it's accepting that there are many other identities there and that they can come together. Come yeah. Together. All right, well, thank one, you. One last thing. Uh, how do you want people to feel belonging? And it's uh, called the third generation. Generation, so uh, the uh, the remark is why? How can you say pe you want people to f uh, to feel uh, have a sense of belonging, but why do you still count, call people count, count them as third generation or second? Yeah. Can I react to that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why, why can you react to that? Third generation Sweden, for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Yeah. I think I think the answer to that question is um, as long as this discrimination that is here goes on, the harassment. Uh, sometimes the even aggressive harassment and the stereotypes that keep being published, um, these people won't feel home. Yeah. But the moment, um, if you want this multicultural society to work um, and to function properly, you have to to remove these things. Yeah. And the moment that is removed then that's the moment we can start to feel home and social co cohesion will do the rest. Yeah. It's only, we need to stop all the negative one-sided reporting. Putting etiquettes like that. Exactly. Labels. All right, I have to thank you. Well, you, you'll be here for a bit after the Definitely. event. Definitely. Yes? So if you have other questions, please come up to them. Yeah. Thank you for now. We'll move on to the last panel. <laughs> so. We're almost at the end of our evening, but uh, we heard so many interesting people are here with interesting experience. So everybody, I'm already inviting you to have a drink downstairs later and talk more about our sense of belonging or disbelonging. Uh, but let's uh, invite our uh, last guest of tonight, Maurice Krul. Please join us at the, me at the stage and Maurits Peters. Um, Maurice Krul is a researcher and professor at the VU, Vrije University. Uh, Maus Peters is marketing director of Welcome, and um, we'll be talking about how the demographic of our cities, of our city of Amsterdam, is rapidly changing. Um, and what does that change mean? Um, what can we also do to make our city more inclusive, more welcoming? We've been talking about that the whole evening, but let's think about that even more. Um, so Maris, you are working on a project called Becoming a Minority, which actually looks at as Amsterdam is a super diverse city in which the white Dutch are becoming a minority. Can you tell us a little bit about your research and about you know, what do you see happening in our city? Well, in Amsterdam, uh, the people of Dutch descent are already a minority. And under the age of 15, only one in three children is of Dutch descent. So also looking into the future, this will be the reality of the city. And I think, and th this relates to the discussion of tonight, that means that we have to reconsider what we consider integration. Because maybe that concept worked 
in the 70s and 80s when small groups integrated into a city where the majority of people were Dutch. So over time they started to become integrated together with, with other people of Dutch descent. But nowadays I think the norm is diversity. So the question is more like who belongs to the diverse city? And if you take that as a st starting point, then actually the people of Dutch descent are the least integrated. In what sense? Can you give an example? They choose to live in the neighborhoods that are least diverse. If they choose a school for their children, white flight, they will choose a school even if they live in a diverse neighborhood that is less diverse. And we also did research into social relationships. People from all kinds of uh, places in the world are forming friendships in Amsterdam, except the people of Dutch descent. Mm -hmm. They live mostly in their own white bubble. So, and that's also what uh, struck me in this evening. We talked about everybody except for one group. <laughs> well, the, the, oh, no. the interviewer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> asked the questions, but actually the people of Dutch descent how is their identity? How is their belonging? We didn't discuss this at all, the whole evening. It's actually a quite remarkable uh, accomplishment uh, <laughs> to do that. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a good thing for once, not talking about that. No, or, I don't think or so. Or do we should, should we talk about yeah, that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of issues there, people Dutch that, that don't know what their identity is. Uh, and, and if they, they belong, if, if they, they belong. still belong. Yeah. I mean, we had one person in the audience expressing a feeling of m not belonging anymore because of the city becoming more religious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a phenomenon. I mean, more and more people that live in Amsterdam are religious. That's a reverse trend that we saw from the 60s and the 70s. I mean, that's also about belonging and identity. And I d don't think we really discuss these issues tonight. And what are the challenges then of that city becoming more diverse challenges for maybe indeed the white Amsterdamers? Well, the biggest challenge is I see uh, ahead is that, of course, since this group is becoming smaller, and if they really are living in this white bubble, mm -hmm. their world will become smaller and smaller. Their networks will become smaller and smaller. And this will affect, uh, for instance, their chances for work. If they can't really engage with other people, if they have a boss of Turkish or Moroccan origin, maybe they cannot function under that uh, boss. They have colleagues that are diverse. Actually, in Amsterdam, you can go to uh, a crash as a child then to a uh, school that is not diverse, to go to gymnasium. And then finally, when you enter in my university, you will find out that Amsterdam is diverse. Mm. So it's very so much what segregated. Have, so it's what have these people yeah. learned about the mm. diverse society? I think that's a, a big issue mm. that we should talk about. <laughs> and what, what is the main issue in that that we should talk about? What is the main point that we should have on the table then? I think the main issue is that the, to change this, people have to make an effort. Mm. So apparently the people of Dutch descent, if they just do what they are doing as they make their life, they uh, do not interact mm. with other people. So they need to make an effort to do this. To get out of their bubble. To get out of their bubble, yeah. Okay, you have to make an effort. Okay. In that sense, it's very interesting that we are sitting right uh, across of each other. Because we're um, with the welcome app, which we just launched. Mm -hmm. We are exactly trying to break through this bubble and promoting stepping out of your bubble. If I can, I absolutely agree with everything you just said. Um, Maurits Peters, yes. uh, you're marketing director for Welcome. Yes. Well, what's in the name? <laughs> welcome. You're welcome to the table. <laughs> welcome Thanks to the so discussion. Much. Give us a bit of a background of what is this Welcome app? Yeah, so um, um, I'm not the original founder. I'm a founding partner. Uh, I joined uh, what is now Welcome uh, shortly after it was uh, launched. Um, we were first called Blend In up until recently. 
Um, we had an online platform where we connected locals and uh, newcomers, status outers, of, yeah, refugees who are here to stay for as long as they prefer, um, and connect them based on uh, similar interests. So um, you could have football, arts, culture as an interest, um, as, a, as a newcomer and as a local you had the same interest and an automatic match was made and you could connect and uh, meet up in person. Um, and we got some traction, we uh, had some engagement and uh, quite a few people heard about us um, and were very enthusiastic. Um, but the platform didn't function according to how we wanted it. And um, we had a chat with an organization that had almost the uh, uh, exact same mission and vision as us, uh, but then within a mobile application and in Sweden. Um, and we discussed with them the possibilities to get the app uh, over here and launch it here and uh, switch Blend into Welcome. And so we did in uh, December 2018. And so uh, if I go and download this app on my phone, what, what can I do? Like, what happens? Um, you can step out of your bubble. <laughs> 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 um, um, like I said, we connect locals and newcomers. Um, where on Facebook you connect with people you uh, most of the time have met or know, um, and on Instagram you follow people that you know or uh, whose world you like to uh, engage with, uh, on, uh, although they're on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, with Welcome, we promote contact with people that you would otherwise not have. So exactly what you're saying, being aware, um, and making an effort. Um, when you open the app, we give you a few f uh, options. You could either uh, post a lunch invitation or uh, accept the invitation of someone else. And as a local, you only get to see the invitations by newcomers. Um, we have the ability to share your professional network. So um, the minority in Amsterdam um, is uh, privileged enough to have a broad professional network, um, which uh, gives them a lot of opportunities work-wise. So 90% 90, 90 of the people who, who find a job find it through a friend or a, a relative w uh, whatsoever. But if you've fled from a conflicted area, you uh, quite possibly, possibly not have this network. So we uh, wanted to give you the ability to um, step into or uh, yeah, have donated someone else's network. That's I don't know if Simone is here. No, she was supposed to be here. Uh, Simone van Dijk is the founder of the Nui Network, um, which he created within the National Denk Tank, mm -hmm. uh, and we adopted this uh, this uh, this concept. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have answering questions and uh, uh, by from uh, from newcomers. Where is a consultation bureau? Where can I find Arabic books? Uh, who could help me with a language uh, Dutch, the Dutch language? Where can I find a, uh, a nice a place to play football uh, in the north of Amsterdam or in Rotterdam, wherever. And then we have a whole list of uh, events and activities that you can join, where locals and newcomers meet each other. So it's events, but it's also one-on-one -on -one yeah. meetings or getting to know someone. Yeah, because there's so many um, uh, interesting and enriching experiences out there by either uh, cultural institutions or uh, similar organizations like ours, nonprofits. Um, they can all post their activities on, on, on our platform, and you have a uh, yeah, beautiful overview. So we should all download the app and yes, she should all definitely sure do this. I think well you are all, well. uh, and you are also people that are uh, aware enough uh, of the challenges that we face as a society, and this is uh, yeah to us we think a perfect tool to uh, engage in uh, yeah your social responsibility and also uh, yeah building a more inclusive society and getting to know other other people's cultures. If I listen to Maurice, we also need an app for the Dutch minority. Well, <coughs> to get them out of their bubble. So here's the thing: we are right? working. We need the, the app for the other way around as well, not just the Dutch minority helping. Well, refugees. it's the same, basically. You could. Uh, uh, yeah, is it? Yeah, we call uh, one group locals and the other newcomers. Mm -hmm. um, but you could say uh, uh, established Dutch people. Uh, that's what they say in Sweden. Uh, so people who have been born and raised here, doesn't matter if they're a minority, the other, the other half or the other target group could engage with, the, with this group. It doesn't matter if they're the majority or the minority.
Yeah, doesn't mean that. I mean, like with what Maurice is saying, it's almost like the Dutch minority should sort of be guided in their own society to take a fresh look at what is actually going on. That you step out of your bubble and that you need to see what is actually going on when you're not in your little bubble. Yeah, that's sorry, sorry <laughs> to interrupt. Um, we do this through uh, campaigns. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're uh, really working on a, uh, intensively on a, on a campaign that targets locals. Um, um, and we now have a proposition that says, help refugees shake their hand, <laughs> uh, help refugees take them out for dinner, or help refugees uh, smile. It can all be very easy and doesn't be uh, doesn't have to be very heavy or political. Um, getting to know each other and uh, stepping through, uh, stepping out of your bubble and getting, getting into, dip, yeah, delving yourself into different cultures, doesn't have to take much really. It's just a simple meaning. Any questions? this evening. Not all of them were white, not all of them had the same religion. Just turn it this way. Not all of them had the same religion. Not all of them come from Please the use same the mic. places. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think it's on. Ah. Yeah. There we go. No, not all of them had the same religion or the mm -hmm. same faces or the same background. And um, while there we all might be living in bubbles, is this not a destructive then conversation to say no uh, uh, that actually there is a, a Dutch community that is defined by a skin tone or a, or a place that they're born and, and not to think of Dutch as actually a broader concept. Than How do you uh, de de define the Dutch minority that you are talking about in your research? Uh, we, we define it uh, uh, as people who are of Dutch descent and that in the definition means that people are born in the Netherlands and both parents are born in the Netherlands. So that also includes other people that are have grandparents coming from Suriname or the Antillians or Indonesia or Turkey or Morocco. So I don't so that think... So in itself is a more diverse it's, it's group. It's a more diverse group, yeah, yeah. But if you talk about people, white people of Dutch ancestry, then it's a different category, of course. Uh, and that, uh, that group is the group that I was referring to that lives in a bubble. So in that sense, it's valuable to talk about this group. And that, I think, is valuable to talk about this group because uh, we are ne we're never talking about this group. Mm -hmm. As if... Uh, uh, this whole idea of living together in diverse city is a task for the immigrants. Yeah. Even if you're third generation, it's still a task. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, while it's never a task for people who have white Dutch ancestry. Mm. And that should change. And I think that needs to change. For, for everybody, this is a good thing to change. Mm. Uh, because uh, that makes it more equal. And that's why I'm, I'm a bit hesitant about the word help, yeah. actually. That's what uh, <laughs> the word also. So, I mean, it's, it's learning from each other. And everybody has different abilities, knowledge, experiences. So it's enriching to have this encounter. Yeah, this was a first... Uh, it was a first... Uh, 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 I just say uh, proposal. Yep. No, so I we're understand. Working we're working but on this with a uh, with yep. a, uh, uh, I just say an advertising agency. This was their first proposal. It was just to uh, 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 give the image of how easy it can be to step out of your bubble. So on the one hand, you have the very urgent uh, 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 message saying help a refugee, and on the other hand, you have the 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 w the wink or. The, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, the other half of the, the message that is uh, shake their hand, take them out to dinner, go to go see a movie, uh, go play football. It's it's just regular human stuff that we do every day with our friends and relatives and yeah, friends of friends. Um, so yeah, w I completely disagree. The one of the first words that we put on a list of words that we did not want to use was help because we promote the. Uh, 
how do you say equality. Equality. Yeah, equality. Yeah, yeah. equality. Yeah. Yeah. That's other questions. I have a question for everyone in this room, actually. So a few months ago, I ran across this chart in The Economist that um, was talking about how, to what degree people from different European countries consider, or what factors they consider to be the most important to their national identities. And this particular chart looked at language. And I was expecting, I live in Paris. I'm from the United States. I was expecting the French to say, to be the most likely to say language is definitive of our national identity. It was actually the Dutch. And I don't remember the actual number, but they were the highest percentage in Europe said language is what it means to be Dutch. <laughs> and so this being one of the most Anglophone cities in Europe that I've ever been to, <laughs> how many of you feel like English is an intrusion on Dutch identity? <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, bring the mic. Oh, please stand up and say it again. <laughs> People, including myself, who are Dutch and curious, um, mostly speak English in such a way that uh, they reach only uh, for 60% wha what they want to say uh, when they communicate with real English-speaking people. That is a figure I got from the magazine that the Amsterdam University publishes when there is a discussion about should lecturers by professors be in Dutch or in English. <laughs> the, the Dutch are to be, <coughs> you should feel sorry for them <laughs> because they think they, their English is so perfect yeah. that they can <laughs> explain what they feel and what they should do about the future. I want to ask Professor Krull Tell us what languages you teach in and what their cor the courses are called, so we can subscribe and come in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well? The we fact is, I hardly teach. Oh. <laughs> That's too bad. But if you teach, is it in English or Dutch? Then it's in English. Then yeah. it's in English, OK. Yeah because that's for the international master students. Exactly, and, yeah. because, and this is important because we are international. <laughs> yeah, sure. We are, we are international. Sure. We have to have a common language. Let me see. The same way it was French, and now it's English. Who cares? I don't okay. care. I'm not. <laughs> I don't have a problem with it at all. <laughs> Here's another question. <laughs> Last question. Really good question. To, to add uh, mm -hmm. all this, um, we talk a lot about identity mm -hmm. as if it was something like fixed. But we always forget history, and therefore we forget politics. Mm -hmm. That means that, uh, of course, that we use the English as a language is actually a reflection of the history of what domi who dominated the world the last century, because in 200 years ago it was the French who uh, colonized the continent with uh, Napoleon and then uh, most of the aristocratic court were speaking French or if you are some people are British here they know the Normans took the over the island and then the noble talk, <laughs> talked French and uh, the peasants talked Saxon so um, I have the feeling that we talk a lot about identities but we never talk about what we do and what we should do and why we think what we think. Where do we come from the rather than what we are doing now or, or th feeling now? I mean, uh, some people may be Muslim, but maybe they haven't have been Muslim all their life. Why are they Muslim now or Christian? Or why am I an atheist now when my great uncle was a priest? Maybe because he died in 1982. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's something important that we always forget is the transitional way. We are very essentialist, I feel. I, we always want to crave on the essence of something. But maybe there is no essence at all. Maybe we change. We are not the same person at 20 than at 40. 
But more, uh, the only advice I would have is like try to um, to know why you think what you think. Because when when we have uh, this feeling of xenophobia, or when we have a, a I mean. The racism and xenophobia is two different things, but xenophobia is a feeling. The people don't know why they are xenophobes, because they are f afraid, but they, it's confused. It's something that you cannot explain, exactly like a religious feeling. But if we would concentrate a little bit more on why, then maybe we could promote other ideas, or see the same problems in a different way. We talk about Islamism, but nobody talk about the fact that it is a sect. A sect. Because uh, in Japan, a, a sect gassed another sect, gassed a metro, but Can they call this a sect. Yeah. Last remark? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> okay, so remember, so, so that's think about who you are, think about where you come from. And which word do we use yeah. to define things? Thank you. Thank you very much. Many, many, many ideas about, I think, belonging, finding a home, maybe not finding a home, going from your bubble, finding other bubbles to connect to, I don't know. My yeah, the last man was not referring to belonging, so. No, yeah, okay, but I'm just rounding up the whole evening, I'm trying mm. to get a grip of what I've been hearing. I don't know, my, hi my head is spinning. I think um, we can all talk on and on about this topic for a long time. And I think we can do that downstairs <laughs> over drinks and all of the guests will be there for at least a little bit, maybe five minutes more. So if you have a really good question, run to them and just ask your question. For now, I want to thank all the guests here. And of course, really a lot of thanks to the people from Are We Europe. Get your copy right there, 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 where? Oh, outside. Okay, oh, you changed. Okay, so it's 10 euros. It looks beautiful. Go and get it. Um, that's it, I think. Uh, do I need to say anything else? Yeah, keep your eye on the agenda online, what is going on here in Pakhuis Zwijger, and we hope to see you again. Thank you very much.